Okay, Brian, here's what we should do. I want to tease him with a little bit. I want you guys to look at these two images, and I want you to guess the difference in power, one versus two. How much more power in position two does it take to match the speed of position number one when you're going 50 kilometers per hour? I'll give you another angle. One versus two. How much more power in position number two do you need to generate in order to match the speed of position number one? We're going to get back to that at the end. And uh, we're going to talk about our experience in the wind tunnel. Brian, good having you back, man. Yeah, it's so good to be back. And what an exciting thing to talk about here. <laughs> Dude, so pumped about it. So so what are we doing? Why are we doing it? Why, why, don't, you, why don't you tell the fans about this experience? Yeah, after a couple of years with COVID kind of, uh, you know, causing a lot of havoc around the world we're we're eyes forward here and we're looking to make some headway and make some big goals um hopefully to make the team for the u.s paralympic national team to go to world championships for the track um which is later this fall 2022 is all brian larson you heard it you heard it here first guys so that's very ambitious so today we decided we're going to the specialized wind tunnel to do some testing. Okay, so Brian, why a wind tunnel? Like, wh what are we doing here? Yeah, so I think, you know, uh, we know that aero matters and some might say aero is everything, but really we're here <laughs> to measure how much uh, wind matters and how much being aero matters. And in the track where you're going in excess of 50, sometimes 55 kilometers an hour, that's like 35 miles an hour. Wind is a huge and the largest point of drag. So we're going to measure, um, a little bit about my position. We're going to measure some equipment and we're just going to try and optimize as much as we can so that I can have my best possible ride, uh, when it comes to turning left sometime later this year. <laughs> Yeah, NASCAR for bikes, right? Exactly. So so Brian's kind of underselling this point of how important it is, especially at those speeds. Aero is everything because I could spend four months in the off season like building that base. I could have this build session for two months. I could hit peak form by summertime. And maybe after all of that dedicated training, nutrition, effort, have a coach, after all of that blood, sweat, and tears... Maybe I'll like get an extra 15 or 20 watts for my FTP if I'm lucky, right? Or you could like shrug your shoulders a little bit and, and save even more. And I'm, I'm spoiling it a little bit. We're going to get to the position, but that's how consequential this is at these speeds that Brian is talking about. So let's break this down. I want to break this down, Brian, into like, first, let's talk about your position and what we did to modify your position and maybe some tips for the folks listening to this, what they can do to their position um, who maybe don't have access to a wind tunnel. Again, we're super privileged to be in this position. And then let's talk about equipment, which I'm super excited about. Both of these th these topics, by the way, we found some, some pretty shocking results. At the end, let's tie all this together. Let's talk about where you were and now where you are in terms of your preparation for Paralympic Games in, in October. You have you have nine months to prepare for this. So um, what do you say we jump into yeah, it? Yeah, let's go, let's go fast. So before we even get started... The first thing that Ingmar had us do, which by the way, Ingmar, I don't know if we've mentioned him yet. He is the professor of aerodynamics. Um, he ha he ran the, the specialized wind tunnel for, for years. He, I think he helped design it. He's like a PhD in aerodynamics, brilliant engineer. And we're gonna talk a lot more about him, but anyway, he was the guy that was um, facilitating this entire experience. He got you in the wind tunnel and got you, got you warmed up and, and got some baselines, right, Brian? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, Step one to anyone that comes in the wind tunnel is, you know, get a little bit warmed up and get comfortable because, you know, it's pretty, it's pretty uncomfortable and be in a time trial position. So step one is to make sure you're actually in your real time trial position. So warming up and get going and get a little bit flexible and then you, and then you sink in and then you start taking a bunch of baseline runs. And for today's test, you know, Ingmar was kind of at the calm here and, and running a lot of this, um, you know, from both a analytics and a statistics uh, perspective but he was having me run you know multiple um, runs and then we basically find kind of standard deviations and average power and average drag across these runs and then once we kind of establish a baseline then it came the point of let's start playing around with position equipment etc because we we know where we are and then we know there's only one way to get faster so yep yeah it was funny that moment when he's like just go in there like get on the bike 
that you ha that you brought. It's your bike with your equipment, your position. Everything is just like, how do you do it? That was the baseline. And then each time we change something, we changed just a single thing, right? Because if you change the wheels, the shoes, and your shoulder position at the same time, it's like you don't know what's doing what. So anyway, those are the basics of the test. Let's dive into your position. What would you say the biggest thing is for new people getting on a bike who don't have access to a wind tunnel? So if, the... you're, if you're in this competitive domain, I mean, if you're super new, it is getting lower for sure. Like really starting out and just even spending time in your aero bars, right? If a novice triathlete comes in, first question, good question is, do you spend time in your aero bars yeah. most of the race? If you're past that stage, then the two big things that we just, you know, talk until we're kind of blue in the face is head position and truck, right? So head position and truck. Head position and truck. Getting your head in front of the body, not like the whole telescope head above, and then getting your shoulders narrow and up together. Those two are massive. Like both of them can be at the speeds you're going 20, 25 watts gains. Ingmar is, like he has seen world tour pros for years and years and years come through this place. So he knows all these little tips and tricks that hopefully if Brian and I do a good job in this video, we will be able to illustrate and help you guys. So um, the first thing he noticed is the shrug, right? Is that, that's what we, what we were calling it, the shrug. Yeah, for sure, the super shrug. So tell us about the shrug and its consequences uh, in terms of aerodynamics. Well, first of all, what is a shrug? Yeah, so I think, you know, the first thing about shrugging is, okay, well, I always used to think, think is like, bring my shoulders like to my ears and kind of lift up. But um, the reality is, is it's like all about mobility. And Ingmar did an awesome job of kind of saying, well, hey, like bring your shoulder blades closer together, which is really hard for me to do, by the way, from, from a from a para and impairment side of things, it's really hard for me to do that with my right arm just because I don't have the same mobility. Um, but nonetheless, he was like, you know, pointing out that a number of professionals come in here can basically get their shoulder blades to touch, which is just baffling. And I mean, I think, you know, with that comes also enabling your head to be in a better position. So it's not just, not just your shoulders. It's not just like where your shoulders fall in the grand scheme of things. It's also about enabling like a good head position that kind of sits in that pocket right in front of your your chest above your forearms there and it's you know all, all of this all it, like like you mentioned uh it's not just one variable right there's everything yeah. effect, affects everything else people think lower is faster and, and you know what it reminded me of you know you go back to like the the lance armstrong uh jan ulrich days of of 20 years ago and you saw jan ulrich like down he was like hugging his front wheel he was so low on the front end and that was the common wisdom for years and years is get low on the front end that's the fastest possible position not anymore we know better now we have the, this crazy technology and we have experts like Ingmar. What you actually want is not this, what you want is this. Yep, that's how I thought too. And so see that height distance, which like most time trials freak out if you talk to them about like, Go we high. want that much more spacers for this position and people freak out. But if you look at all the world tour uh, bikes these days, they all have a very large step. And they used to have none, right? Like, Cancelara. Our TT geometry hasn't changed since our Cancellara. We've gone from like no stack to like these towers. And that is for that exact reason. Have some stack height on your front end. And what that does is that allows you to get that shrug going. It opens up your hip angle a little bit. We'll talk more about that in a second. But now you see Casper Asgreen and some of these professional time trial specialists with this crazy high stack. It's kind of counterintuitive. You don't associate a high stack with high performance generally but nowadays we we know that's the case for me i thought i had a decent shrug and it wasn't bad you know um but the 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 shocking amount was you know we went around the horn and we started playing bets and guesses around how much of a difference i think i said like two or three watts or something like that difference yeah but um yeah i don't know you want do you want to talk, should we start talking numbers here L well let's talk numbers in a moment i want to first talk about the actual changes that that you made on your bike what this means for your priority race in October. So you raised your front end based on what we were just talking about. You raised that stack on your handlebars by how much? Like four centimeters. Four centimeters. That's a lot. There was no compromise in speed or power. Effectively right? none. Effectively Eff none. Effectively no compromise, even though you're higher on the front end. What does that do for us? If we're raising our front end, it opens our hip angle. We, are, we can comfortably make more power. So there's this potential to make more power 
with this new position. And then not only is it is it no slower, also there's this opportunity to get even faster. How much faster if you can adopt the shrug in your in your typical position? Yep, Fif 15 watts faster if you can shrug. 15 watts. That is insane. So again, this is like a, a whole off season worth of training. If you're lucky, you can get 15 watts. So the idea is you are starting off with this four centimeter stack on your front end, which you feel comfortable with the really tight shrug there. And then um, you can generate more power. And then as we approach your target event in October, you can slowly lower that four centimeters. And if you can still shrug where you were before, four centimeters lower, you're 15 watts faster for free. <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, I could shrug at the lower position, um, but it's really uncomfortable, right? And and it's all about adapting to it, like you said, and taking time, spending time, probably on the trainer, a lot of it, just sitting there with, you know, maybe a mirror or something in front of me and just yeah. thinking about that shrug, right? Um, and then I'll slowly chip away at getting lower and lower. That's exactly And really, it. other than that, position-wise, like, you were, you were golden, man. Yeah, I mean, we, we were joking about, like, after doing the shrug that the session was over and that we could go home, I think, right? <laughs> no, equipment. Let's talk about equipment. I'm excited about it. I know you guys are, too. So let's dive into equipment. So the first thing that we addressed with equipment is when we first rolled in there, Ingmar was like, huh, a disc on the front. That's interesting. Um, do you guys know that a five-spoke is just as fast as a disc, right? And we were kind of scratching our heads because that... I always just figured like, hey, run two discs, that's going to be the most aero setup. But no, five spoke on the front, just as fast and better performance on outdoor velodromes. You're not so worried about a crosswind blowing you off the road, right? So, um, and Hellier is an outdoor velodrome, by the way, which is where you do a lot of your training. So first thing we did, swapped out the five spoke, saw just the same results. So we had the wheels and tires sorted out. We, we moved on to helmets next. But helmets um, are a very individual thing. What ended up being the best testing helmet for you, Brian? Yeah, so lucky to lucky for me and, and for you know my sponsors, uh, the Pock Tempor <laughs> was in fact uh, the best helmet for me, which is a, you know a pretty ugly looking helmet. Um, <laughs> it's pretty. You basically look like a Martian when you're standing there. So there's that. There's you got that going for you, Brian. Yeah, it's super goofy, but it's actually you know like you said, it's very. Um, it's very not just rider specific, but position specific. So, you yeah. know, on the track bike, I don't really have to look really far up the road. I can look basically just in front of me, so I don't have to pick my head up too much. And then those, the, the pock is really wide and actually kind of helps deflect air over my shoulders. Okay, and then finally that brings us to skin suits. We had a bunch to try on. I wanted to thank Specialized for having like a variety of selections, flagship models from top tier brands. And that really just shows me like they were interested the whole experience here was just like, how fast can we get our athletes? They didn't care about ramming specialized branded stuff down your throat. It was it was pretty cool. So so big props to them. And with that said, what did we have? We had, well, we had a bunch to choose from, but you ended up choosing um, uh, no pins, a Castelli, specialized, of course. And then finally, your sponsor appropriate Starlight Apparel skin suits. And <laughs> mind blown. I couldn't believe this, you guys. So um, let's play another game with them, Brian. So what do you guys think? First of all, the worst performer and the best performer. Which ones were those? And then what was the difference in watts between the worst and the best? In other words, how many more watts, if you're wearing the worst performing skin suit, would you have to generate in order to match the speed of the best performing skin suit? All Everything else being equal at 50 kilometers per hour. And well, we'll, pause, we'll pause here. <laughs> double it. Du whatever you're thinking, double it because it's 20 watts difference. I couldn't believe it. That's crazy. That's a lot of power, you guys. Um, 20 watts in, in your track event that you're targeting, 4K? That's four seconds. That's like I won versus I'm not even on the podium. <laughs> it's, it's that <laughs> consequential. It's crazy. So, um, worst performer? I was surprised by this because I've heard a lot of good things about this brand. I think they do a lot of, a lot of things well, but um, speed is not one of them, apparently. No pins. No pins did not do very well. Um, you dodged another bullet, Brian, the best performer, Starlight Apparel. So you don't have to go ahead and switch sponsors anytime soon. You can continue using Starlight Apparel. But I wanted your, your take because there's this crazy thing about textures. I want you to tell us really quickly about how textures impact performance. Yeah, I mean, Ingmar was the one that was kind of enlightening us uh, for sure when we were there. But uh, texture is a huge factor in why these skin suits were fast or slow um, and sp specifically at this speed. So texture is very speed dependent and very position dependent. 
um, and where that texture is on your body. So at slow speeds, so say 10 or less miles an hour, texture doesn't really matter that much. Same thing at like 70 miles an hour. Um, but in the case for us, when we were traveling at 50, 55 kilometers an hour, or like 30 miles an hour, Race texture pace. was critical. And specifically texture around cylinders. So apparently, um, the cro and what I mean by cylinders is like the cross section of that part of your body. If that is a cylinder, it's very slow um, in the air. So things like your biceps, like around your, your upper arms or your legs, like you want to cover as much of that as possible with texture. Um, skin is slow, uh, which is yeah. kind of silly, but um, you know, uh, putting some type of tight fabric that is textured with these kind of long lines is is going to help you out tremendously and i think most of the wattage gained came from that texture in these in these areas especially in the socks and the in the sleeves and this is why you, you found some of the belgian pros getting in trouble what was it like two years ago putting like textured it was like weird it was like textured oil on their legs during time trials do you remember that kind of scandal it was like deflate gate for for us cyclists so anyway nine months away is your target event you're going to work on that position it takes training just like anything else but I want to bring this back to the beginning of the video. And I want to show this clip again. We, ha we, I, I, I loved that I did this with you, Brian. We put you back in your fastest equipment possible, your fastest position, fastest equipment, nothing changed. What is the difference at 50 kilometers per hour between category Fred right here and category frenemy right here? Take your guess. 85 watts, so 85 watts saved if you can tuck your head in, shrug your shoulders and ride the bike like the pro that Brian is. So I want you guys to hopefully glean some information from here. Take this information to your next road race, your next time trial, your next track event, your next Grand Fondo, your next local Alviso crit group ride. It doesn't matter um, because other than fighting amongst ourselves, the biggest thing we fight against is the wind and we want we must defeat the wind together. So thanks, Brian, for, for coming on, man. It's great having you. Yeah, th thanks, Jeff. And, you know, thanks, Specialized. And thanks, Ingmar, for um, giving what I, giving me what I would call, you know, kind of a core memory here. And after 19 years of racing, this is something I know that is going to stand out as one of the things I remember forever. Um, and so now we we know what we know, and it's all about kind of practicing the position, trying to get those – that those shoulder blades in and, and shrug a little bit better and and winning towards, a qualifier <laughs> and win a call qualifier and hopefully go to world championships later this year so yeah we're all pulling for you dude so um with that said thanks guys and uh we'll catch you in the next one